I'm Marcy pitt sufis I direct the Sloan Center on Aging and Work at Boston College, and I'm on faculty at both the Graduate School of Social Work and the School of Management at Boston College. At the Center on Aging and Work, we do a lot of workshops, sometimes with employers, sometimes with employees, and ask a very basic question about how old is old? And uh, people's first answer tends to be, a birth date. That is, people over a certain age, they consider old. There are a lot of surveys about this. Um, uh, it varies, by the way, for men and women. People come up with slightly different ages. Um, uh, but we, you know, we probe a little bit more. And here are the kind of questions that older workers should consider. Uh, your chronological age might be different than a career stage. That's very important for employers. So the example would be, in a lot of our surveys, uh, you have younger workers who say they're late career. Uh, that has some implications for employers if that person's on the job market. You also may have older workers who are excited about uh, starting a different kind of a career, whether it's related or quite different. So they may be an older adult with experience, and bring to, to the job market the enthusiasm, the desire to learn of an early career person. And so if you think about that, we all know, for example, physical age can, there's a wide range of people who feel young and old. I think in our own minds we can uh, think of people who, for example, would be 60, some of whom uh, are facing some significant physical challenges and they might say that they feel older. Other people at 60 who feel uh, very vibrant and uh, feel that they don't have those physical challenges and would say they're younger. And so the important thing for, for older adults as they're looking for jobs is not to narrow their own idea about what age means, that it's uh, immediate, that they're going to put themselves in a certain bucket uh, because age is a much more complicated experience. Uh, another dimension of that is, you know, how old are you? And of course, the next question is compared to whom? So that you may be in a workplace where you're working predominantly with people who are older than you are. And almost no matter what age you, you are, you feel younger. So that if you go into a workplace and most people are in their late 60s, if you're in your late 50s, you feel like a youngster. You know, and If you're in your late 50s and work with people in their 20s, you might feel much older. Uh, so to keep that in mind, I think that it essentially helps to put age in perspective. Um, and although employers, uh, if they don't know you, uh, might first look and say, oh boy, this person's probably going to have expectations of a salary, whatever, I think the important thing is that the applicant uh, conveys the, the full story about uh, how their age can help them bring uh, good things to the workplace, very valuable contributions, but they also may be bringing to the workplace orientation, attitudes, expectations that an employer uh, might pleasantly expect of a younger person and then value, of course, that it's a characteristic that in one sense is separate from chronological age. Well, employers are in a situation right now where they look at talent, both the talent they have as well as the talent that they're going to need in the future. And it becomes complicated for them in part due to the economic recession. So that uh, the assessments oftentimes are fairly short term. That being said, that they're always interested in getting the right people with the right set of competencies to do the jobs that they have in front of them. Uh, as they think about older workers, the kinds of questions employers typically will ask are where are the critical jobs, uh, who's holding those jobs, and are the people in those jobs more or less secure in terms of uh, the employer's ability to kind of depend that they'll be there at least over the short term. So with regard to older workers, usually the first conversation is focused on whether or not the current older workers that they have, who bring talent and competencies needed by the employers, 
whether they're going to stay uh, as long as the employers want, so that the focus oftentimes gets concerned, uh, focused either on premature leaving, uh, and that, that comes up in some industry sectors with some jobs, or whether or not they can anticipate a large number of people uh, in certain kinds of jobs or functions that would retire early without uh, good plans for replacement. Employers' perceptions of older workers uh, ends up being a pretty complicated story. One piece to the story is that uh, employers' perceptions of older workers in general oftentimes is different than when you ask them about the older workers that actually work for them. Um, and I mention that distinction because employers, like the rest of people in society, may be susceptible to picking up commonly held attitudes without checking themselves if they're people they don't know. Uh, the reason that's important is really during the hiring process is that we're uh, much more likely to fall back on um, either stereotypes or commonly held attitudes if it's somebody that uh, hasn't proven themselves to you or hasn't demonstrated the value they can add. In contrast, when you ask employers about people who work for them um, and ask them whether there may be differences of strengths uh, that workers at different career stages might bring, employers tend to be very candid and their voice uh, oftentimes is fairly clear that they recognize there are a lot of attributes that experienced older workers bring to the workplace that they feel can be critical to their business. Uh, one area that is often brought up, uh, both in conversations and in survey work, is that older workers who bring strong connections either to customers or to other professionals that address key business problems. Uh, it can take a long time to build up those relationships and employers understand that and value that. Um, there are other areas that are quite tied to productivity that employers may mention. Uh, and it depends on the kinds of job, but uh, absenteeism rates, for example, tend to be lower uh, among older workers. However, when they're, when they're ill, their, uh, their absences tend to be a little bit longer. Uh, rates in some businesses, they're concerned about either safety or um, losses that may have to do, for example, with theft. Uh, tend to be much less uh, around older workers. So that they're, depending on the, the kind of occupation, uh, I think a lot of uh, employers recognize that there's both competency sets and attitudes to work that are very valuable. The one area of concern that employers uh, will share is they worry about um, out-of-date skills, particularly in the area of technology. And uh, it's a challenge to both employers and to employees to take continuous learning very seriously. The biggest challenge facing uh, many of today's older adults who are looking for jobs, uh, it can be very tricky. Uh, there's been a lot of research which indicates that it takes older workers uh, significantly longer to get the interviews and to get job offers than somebody with comparable sets of skills if they're younger. Uh, that uh, there's, although sometimes there are suggestions people make about uh, being sure that the emphasis is on competencies and skills, it can be discouraging for older workers who clearly bring a lot of experience. Uh, I think one of the most important things that older workers can emphasize and uh, need to bring the evidence to the table is that they uh, continue to be invested in learning, keeping skills up to date, um, and also to uh, be able to share with employers their ability to uh, do complex problem solving and, as I mentioned before, uh, to be able to bring experience in people they know, that knowledge base that uh, can take a long time in many occupations to build. Experience can matter a lot. Uh, there are a lot of interesting studies that have gone on about how people do problem solving. And there's an interesting combination of people who are able to quickly in their minds review solutions that 
in different situations have worked or not work and can bring that kind of, of, of experience to the conversations. But I think also important is that both older workers and younger workers respect and appreciate the uh, different approaches that their colleagues may be taking to do some problem solving. One of the recent experiences we had with our innovation lab is that we asked people a little bit about their, their attitudes of people 10 years younger and 10 years older. It wasn't an absolute age, uh, but we found after having a very positive work experience that workers of all ages tended to, uh, to be much more open to the positive characteristics that their colleagues of different ages would bring. I think a second thing that's important to mention is uh, despite some of both the media attention and I would say uh, the, the movie lines about the potential of generation clashes at the workplace, uh, surveys would suggest there's much less of that uh, even in those situations where older workers have a supervisor who's younger than they are, that it doesn't seem to elicit the kind of conflict that uh, we might imagine could happen. Uh, I think that that uh, you know, oftentimes when there are complementary sets uh, or attributes that older workers and younger workers bring to the workplace, that uh, by and large in a workplace that tends to be a, a constructive work environment, uh, people are just happy to push up their sleeves and, and kind of get to work and, and put together the range of skills that, that people might bring. There are some industry sectors, an example might be uh, in construction or some manufacturing, where the workforce is actually younger. Uh, in part, that's due to the demands of the work itself. Employers in those sectors, however, uh, may be particularly interested in the aging of the workforce for two reasons. They tend to be industry sectors that are dependent on uh, apprenticeship models so that more experienced workers will train the younger workers uh, and the future of the industry's success will depend on retaining some of those more experienced workers. A second uh, type of pressure that some industry sectors feel are directly related to uh, the aging of the workforce itself and of course they're particularly concerned about the possibility of a very large group, a large cohort of older workers retiring essentially together. Uh, the example that uh, is probably the most poignant is the healthcare industry sector, uh, in part because of the very critical role nurses play, and as a profession, nurses ten, tend to be older. You know, in that case, uh, the healthcare industry sector is quite concerned with getting younger workers in the pipeline, but as they're doing that, they also want to retain their older workers to ensure, of course, that services can continue to be offered. Uh, so that would be the reason that employers in the healthcare sector, for some time really, have been quite interested in uh, more innovative ways of being sure that jobs can be structured and organized to fit some of the preferences and needs of, of older workers. A third business case uh, is probably most relevant to those industry sectors where employees have direct contact with clients or customers. It might be professional services, uh, but the one that I think most of us are most familiar with would be the retail sector. Uh, they face a different kind of challenge. One is at least in retail, the turnover rates continue to be higher than a lot of, of other industry sectors. But the retail sector has also been uh, essentially kind of early learners about some of the value that older workers might bring. And there have been some studies within the retail sector which suggest that uh, their customer service ratings may be higher among older workers. Uh, it's not necessarily that older people uh, have unique sets of skills, but sometimes through life experience, your approach might be different. So that's one reason that the retail employers would be interested. But they also are quite interested in if the approach that 
that their older workers are naturally taking, how can they train their younger customer sales associates so that customers come in and find that they're comfortable uh, with the people serving them. Now truly there can be a cost with workers at all stages and that's why this conversation uh, is usually more productive when you think about it as a life cycle process rather than picking a certain life stage and say, oh, let's look at the, the, the uh, return on investment just for older workers. So let me give you a couple examples that certainly uh, when employers think of costs and benefits, for their younger workers, uh, they certainly understand the possible benefits they can reap if they invest a lot in training and development. The challenge, of course, in that stage of life is that our younger workers and early career workers are much more likely to turn over. So there's a huge risk for employers. Other costs may be lower. Their salaries might be lower. Uh, some industries, although it's not totally universal, indicate that their youngest workers, uh, when they put them into their insurance pools, again, those costs are lower. But there are these other costs. Uh, when you get to midlife and mid-career, uh, there may be less investment in some of that intense uh, leadership training or learning and development, but there are some different kinds of costs uh, along with the wonderful benefits you get for, for workers at that stage of life. Uh, the costs that often come up, um, although the incidence rate is low, but you think of people in midlife, mid-career, uh, that may have, for example, uh, expensive uh, births. It tends to be a very high cost, high ticket item for health insurance. More likely to happen then, but of course employers wouldn't say, oh boy, we don't want to hire people at mid-career, mid-life, you know, in case there are some of these expensive, uh, again, low numbers, but very large ticket items for health insurance. Much like they wouldn't say, we don't want to hire younger workers because we're going to have to invest you know, in training and development. So that's when, when you get to the, the late career workers, the older workers, uh, they may find that, uh, that certain investments decrease. Uh, there may be some costs that end up increasing. Uh, as I said before, uh, a concern, particularly in an economic downturn, might be salaries that oftentimes are, are reflective of experience, uh, but of course then there's the, either the productivity or the range of, of, uh, of value that the older workers may bring, some of which is not quantified. Uh, so uh, the example would be if they are informally mentoring a lot of younger workers, that may not be on their performance assessment and employers uh, may need to think about uh, making some adjustments essentially in how they look at not just a, an annual performance review, but how do we determine some of the value people might add that's not on our individual scorecards. It's important for employees and it's important for employers to look at the total package of uh, both expectations and contributions that workers can make, again, across their life cycle. And I say that because uh, it's important that older workers don't get caught into a situation of feeling they can trade off one competency set for another uh, because there may be points in time that employers need to draw from a competency set and if we uh, assume that experience will trump uh, technological skills, we might find ourselves in, in a pickle. And so um, I think it's important for all of us to keep up a range of competency sets. That being said, I, uh, there are two things around technology that I think sometimes we overlook. One of which is uh, right now there are a number of surveys that indicate increases in certain kinds of technology use. Uh, the, the road of growth is uh, excuse me, the uh, rate of growth um, of use of certain technology is higher among our older adults than younger adults. That's not to say that older adults are using it more, but it's the increase in, in how they're using it. And it's important because uh, that certainly would fly in the face of assumptions that we might make 
you know, it's sort of the, the, the old adage, well, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, it might be true for dogs, but it's not true for people. And I think that um, a lot of older adults are realizing that in the right kinds of situation, uh, although all of us, no matter whether you're six or you're 65, it's uncomfortable to feel like you're in a situation, particularly public situations where you're learning something, uh, that you, you may not feel that you can quickly uh, demonstrate capacity. Uh, but it is true that I think that older adults uh, certainly can le learn new technologies, and many feel that they would like to and uh, may not have the right opportunities. The second thing I will say is that technological skills indeed uh, are most valuable when you have this skill combined with wisdom. And that's getting back to the question about the value that uh, older adults, more experienced adults might bring. I think uh, one of the common concerns in society in general, but certainly at the workplace, is that uh, being able to select and focus on the right kind of information rather than just bringing all the information to the table is particularly important. Um, there's a, an observation that's often made in businesses that the people who can solve an immediate problem are those people who are most valued in the organization. And I think all of us need to be prepared to be problem solvers. We need to have a solution-focused orientation and the combination of bringing experience and wisdom to the table with contemporary skills and competency sets um, I think can well position older workers. At the Sloan Center on Aging and Work, we focus on eight dimensions of what we think help us understand what are good jobs or high quality jobs. Uh, some of these dimensions are uh, aspects of a job that all of us would recognize are important. So, of course, we all want to think about compensation and benefits. As it turns out, that tends to be more important for some people at certain stages of their lives and less important at others. Uh, so that may not be, uh, although all of us would say it's important, it may vary in, in terms of how important it is. There are other aspects of what's a good job, particularly for uh, older workers, uh, that tend to be more of a relationship dimension. So it may be either uh, the relationships with supervisors and coworkers, uh, or it may be the kind of social environment or the culture, the extent to which people feel either included or excluded at the workplace. Those can become particularly important. Um, I, I want to focus a little bit on relationships with supervisors. Uh, it seems to be from some early data that supervisors feel they have been best prepared to work with early career and mid-career employees. Uh, it's not that they're uncomfortable working with late career employees, but in their own training, um, I think sometimes, uh, whether it's business schools or the kind of professional training we receive after uh, we leave university settings, that we tend to focus less on how to promote the continued development of late career workers. And uh, that could be particularly important for older workers to continue to feel that they're given opportunities for challenging assignment, assignments, um, that their supervisors aren't making an assumption, oh boy, they're, they're on their way out. Because indeed, uh, a lot of older workers indicate that they plan to work not only through retirement years, but after they've officially retired. And I think um, that's new, ch new sets of challenges for supervisors of how you have somebody who's has a long career and essentially is saying to their supervisor, I have a lot more to contribute. As employers are thinking uh, about the characteristics of good jobs for older workers, one interesting area that has developed is thinking about ways to adjust wellness initiatives. In part, it's responding to older workers so that they can continue to work. Uh, some of this might be in the realm of erg ergonomics, so that certainly there are technologies and uh, in other areas there may be job redesign, again, like flexible work options. Uh, one of the appeals of looking at wellness uh, for older workers is that employers are beginning to anticipate 
that uh, they should be starting these conversations, of course, earlier if uh, they can uh, offer approaches to their employees so that employees can adopt healthy lifestyles uh, and, and so that they really have real choices and opportunities when they are older workers uh, that they can decide to continue to work because indeed one of the reasons people leave the work prematurely is, is health. And so that's an area that I think a lot of employers are saying this, this could be a, a very important set um, of initiatives. The, the final thing I will say, although, you know, as I say, that's a complex set of characteristics of what makes a good job for older workers, uh, it would be important not to overlook the issue of learning and development in part because that gets linked to another characteristic of a good job for older workers is how employees feel jobs can be meaningful to them. They tend to be related because people feel jobs are meaningful if the job is tapping into competency sets and skills that uh, really invigorate the employee. And so for employers to be sure that their learning and development is really truly inviting and welcoming of workers of all ages, uh, particularly for older workers who might feel hesitant to engage. I think on the other side that employers will find that their workforce indicates that their jobs are very meaningful to them.